because I never imagined I would do this. I never did. You know, I grew up not far from here, studied science in college, got a graduate degree in geology. And just the other night, I was explaining to a group down in Bloomington that I'm probably the only state treasurer in the history of the United States of America whose graduate dissertation was in the field of invertebrate paleontology. <laughs> and that's true. And someone spoke up, I swear this is true, someone spoke up and said, well, Richard, you were destined to stand strong in politics then because you're used to working with spineless creatures. <laughs> was it really just 17 months ago when this movement began to awake? Was it really just 17 months ago when friends would pick up the phone and call others and say, you know, I've never been in politics before, but would you come join us? Would you come step forward? And I will tell you, as I'm here today, I have been so blessed by so many of you. As I give you names in just a moment, you're going to just hear names, but I'm going to see faces. People like Diane, John, Jenny, Mark, Susan, Susie, people who have never been involved in politics until this year. But they have been aroused to realize there is something wrong with this nation and it is time for every citizen to step forward. And I'm proud to have them help my campaign. They are great people. As they started making those phone calls, and many of you did, it started from one or two people kind of connecting and then coming together and saying, would you join me at the county courthouse? Would you join me at the city building just to hold up a sign? Many of them gathered not knowing if there'd be two people there or two dozen or 200. And something amazing began to happen. Crowds were gathering not just at the courthouses, but they were kind of reinforcing each other. So finally, on April 15, 2009, some 5,000 people gathered right outside my window at the State House. It was an amazing thing. But as you know, it didn't end there. That was only the beginning. Just a little over a year ago, I was, received the privilege of my life to stand on the west steps of the United States Capitol and look over 1.4 million people. And as one of the speakers said so eloquently and so perfectly that day, President Obama said if we would be protesting, he was going to call us out. Mr. President, here we are. We've come to see you. We've been called. And so we were. And we still hear that calling. But of course, it's not just when we began to gather some 17 months ago, but it is really about why. Why was it people were gathering on those courthouse steps? Why was it they were doing things they've never done before? And I know the answer, and all of you do too. It wasn't really something as complex as political ideology. It wasn't as complex as just wanting to be heard and dealing with this great Republican democracy. What caused those people to be there in their heart is still in this room right now. It is fear. It is fear of what we may be losing in this country that has caused so many to step forward. And fear is an incredible motivator. Is all Are the know. laws being obeyed? Is that constitution being revered? You know, when the health care bill was being introduced, that massive piece of legislation that we needed to pass so we could all figure out later what was in it, when Nancy Pelosi was asked, show me what line in the Constitution justifies the passing of this health bill and giving the United States government the right to issue a health care mandate, you know what she said? Three words. Are you serious? That's what she said. That's setting aside the law. It is totally setting aside the law. For the United States government to tell you what you must do by way of your health care is indeed nowhere in the Constitution, and I am quite serious. And yes, I must share with you a few comments about the case that Peter referenced in his introduction, the Chrysler case, because, oh yeah, I've been beat up a bunch for that. I proudly wear the scars, by the way. It, it,
I'm not going to give you the whole Chrysler speech here, but by actual count, as of Thursday of this week, I have given that 40-minute speech 122 times. Because everywhere I go, people are still incredulous that it could have happened in the United States of America. And here's the story in a very brief nutshell. Three funds of state government, the Major Moves Construction Fund, the Indiana State Police Pension Fund, for which I so serve as a sole trustee, and the Teachers Retirement Fund of Indiana, bought secured debt of Chrysler Corporation in July of 2008. If you're not in the world of high finance, secured debt may sound kind of mysterious. It really isn't. It simply means when you buy that debt, in the event of that nightmare scenario where there's a meltdown and a bankruptcy, it means you get your money back first. Now understand, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a single penny back, but there's two types of creditors. There's secured and unsecured. Before any unsecured creditor would receive a single penny, every secured creditor would be paid off in full. That's been bankruptcy law for almost 200 years until Chrysler. In the Chrysler case, the United States government, not, not Chrysler, the United States government orchestrated a bankruptcy that took the secured creditors who were first in line and said, no, no, you're not really first in line. You're down here at the bottom of the pile. And then they told us instead of getting anything close to what all the markets said would be the fair value, that we were going to have to accept 29 cents on the dollar. The big banks who held the vast majority of that debt started bouncing off the ceiling and they're saying, wait a minute, we've known Chrysler for decades. They've got billions of dollars of assets. We own 6.6 .6 billion of theirs. We deserve 100 cents on the dollar. And the United States Treasury said, no, you're not getting 100 cents. But, but we're secured creditors. Doesn't matter, you're not getting 100 cents on the dollar, you're getting 29 cents. Three days later, the heads of those big banks, all with smiles on their faces, walked before TV cameras and said, we're going to be happy to accept 29 cents on the dollar. What changed? What changed in those 72 hours? Every one of you ought to be wondering, what the heck changed? You know, bankers normally have the adjective cold-hearted in their names. And why would these cold-hearted bankers suddenly accept taking a huge loss? Here's why. Here's why. Because officials of the United States Treasury took them aside and said basically this, boys, don't you get it? Don't you get it? We've put $90 billion in your banks. We've told you, you're too big to fail. You don't have to worry about losses anymore. American taxpayers got your back. Welcome to the danger of nationalized banking, my friends. When the government can drive the banks to do what the government wants the credit markets to do. It's a horrible precedent. We took the case all the way to the United States Supreme Court. We were not able to stop the bankruptcy, or is it sometimes called the sale? And by the way, let me describe that for you for just a moment, because oftentimes you hear about the sale of Chrysler Corporation because it was set up by the United States government, not Chrysler. It was set up by the United States government that Fiat, the Italian automaker, would end up owning a big stake in Chrysler and they would run the company and their management would run the company. If you use the value that we received at 29 cents on the dollar, what Fiat received was worth $459 million on day one. And do you know how much they paid for it? Zero! Nothing. It was given to them by the United States government. They didn't have to invest a penny, and their chairman, Sergio Marchione, has insisted ever since they will not invest money in Chrysler. So we have a national policy that says it's fine to rip off the likes of Indiana's retired teachers and retired state policemen while we subsidize a foreign automaker. Do any of you think that is good national policy? No. That's where we are. By the way, that's the 123rd time I've asked that question. I've not gotten a yes once. I'm often asked, you know, Richard, you're a science geek. You're a geologist. Never held a full-time government job before doing this. And I'm asked, where did you get the backbone to stand up to this and go all the way against the White House? And I'll tell you when. It's when, at that moment, all the other lawsuits had been dropped and only Indiana was left standing. When that happened, I remember looking at my computer screen and thinking, oh my God, there are 305 million Americans. Why am I the one who has to do this? 
And yet we weren't going to back down. And that day, the President of the United States, the President of the United States, reacting to what I was doing, went through a microphone and said, and I quote, anyone who would try to stop the Chrysler bankruptcy is an unpatriotic American, a greedy speculator, someone unwilling to satisfy or to sacrifice for the good of community, end quote. At that moment, I knew I had all the resolve I would ever need. You see, and I don't often share this, but I know a woman who worked her entire career in the public school system. She wasn't a teacher. She was a secretary in the superintendent's office. But today, she is retired on a teacher's pension fund. I know a gentleman who worked 28 years as a state policeman, and today he is retired on a state police pension fund. Both of those people, both of them, are veterans of World War II, having served in the United States Navy. And they are my parents. It was barely 10 years ago when Tom Brokaw wrote a wonderful book, and he called it The Greatest Generation, honoring people like my parents who'd worked and toiled and sweat and earned. And 10 years later, the President of the United States calls such people unpatriotic, greedy speculators. My friends, that is not Hope acceptable is about from that the President freedom of the United of living States. The way you want to live, how you want to live, where you live. It's not about hoping government will bail us out at every bad turn. Hope is about a better tomorrow, not about implementing policies that are going to forever cripple the American economy. These are tough times, economically. And we're being defined by them. This is a historical time, whether we like it or not. And in many ways, I think America will forever be defined by how we come out. We are 44 days from one of those moments where this test tube of American democracy this great experiment that continues is about to again be shaken. And I think it's going to get a pretty good shaking myself. And the question now that I hope all of you take to heart, and I know this light, this beacon of excitement that you have is going to be further moved on by Glenn Beck. But it really isn't about Glenn Beck. It isn't about those of us who've had the privilege to stand here in front of you. It is about you. It's about what you're going to do between now and November 2nd. Are you going to simply, yeah, call that same person that you spoke with before when you went through your first Tea Party rally? Or are you going to call some others? Are you going to drive not just to the polls at 6 a.m. on Election Day, or are you going to take all your friends, all your family, and all your neighbors with you? You know, the American democracy, this great experiment, is never a single experiment. It is about all 305 million of us. And it's been said here so much better this morning than I'm doing it by so many others. This is our opportunity. This is our chance. You know, this great nation has been described as the beacon of liberty that last best hope of Earth, the light of the world, the shining city on a hill. And though some may think that lamp and that brightness and those lights are about to go out, I think they're about to be relit. My friends, that's our chance. That's our duty. November 2nd, we gather at sunrise. <laughs>